This is why anybody that say I love God, but I don't like my brother or my sister, you don't understand how this thing works. You're missing it. It's, it you can't say that you love God and hate his children. Because he actually, God actually shows his kindness through people. He expresses himself through people. So when you say that you hate people and you love God, you're lying. Because honoring man is actually a form of honoring God. If we look at how they paid tithes to the Levites, the Levites actually got to enjoy the stuff that they was tithing. But it was actually a form of worshiping God by honoring men. You know, when God revealed his glory at a certain place, they would build an altar and they would put sacrifices on the altar. Wherever God revealed himself, they would put sacrifices on the altar to honor God. So they was dealing with earth, but they understood they was really dealing with God. So tonight we're gonna to be talking about honor, y'all. We're gonna be talking about honor. And it's a lot to this subject. It's a lot of God in this subject. So it's too much of God in this subject to cover in just one night. And so for the next couple of times you see me up here, I'm gonna be talking about honor, Lord spare. Um, but there's, there's four major points to this text that I want to cover that we're going to be coming out of tonight. But tonight we're just going to focus on one part of it. We're going to focus on the A part of this text. And we're just going to take our time tonight. We're not going to rush it. Wherever we fall, we're just going to wrap it up. We're going to go home and go to bed and catch it next time. Amen. Because it's not about, it's not about the, the quantity. It's about the quality. Like Deacon Bryce said. Y'all remember that message? It's about the quality. It's not about how much scripture you know, it's about how much you can live, amen? That's a quote from First Lady, amen? <laughs> amen, and so tonight we're gonna to be talking about, the name of this message is gonna be called Missing God, amen? The name of this message we're gonna be covering tonight is Missing God. Because a lot of times I believe we get so focused on man that we miss God. Sometimes we get so focused on earth that we miss what heaven is doing. Amen. We get so focused on humanity that we can't see divinity operating, operating within humanity. Amen. And so tonight we just going to talk about it. Because like when we hear messages like tithing, sometimes people might say, oh, pastors always want to take our money and blah, blah, blah. But listen, sometimes you're getting too focused on humanity. And you're missing that God actually in, installed things like the tide to preserve humanity. But a lot of times we'll use the flaws of men to mask the rebellion in our own heart. Amen. I, 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 my daughter, I forgot what, what, what I actually sent her to do, but I had, I had asked her to go tell her brothers to stop doing something in the back. I said, go, go tell your brothers. I said, calm down back there. And the Lord allowed me to hear, and I heard, I overheard one of them getting spicy with her, amen? He said, no! I'm like, well, God did. And, and the Lord whispered to me in my ear, he said, you know, if you had sent that girl to tell them that they had ice cream up here, they would come up here rejoicing, amen? They wouldn't struggle with believing, they would come and they would receive that word with gladness. And I thought to myself, I said, man, it's not that they had a problem with the messengers, that they had a problem with the message and they found fault with the messenger. And we could do that sometimes if we're not careful, y'all. We could find fault with the messenger because we don't like the message. And we could accidentally wind up crucifying the messenger. And sometimes when you, when you fight against the ambassador, you're actually fighting against the king. And so we're just gonna talk about honor today so we make sure we never wind up fighting against the ambassadors of God, amen? But we want to start off by giving glory to God. We want to give glory to the all-wise God who is beyond finding out. He's the God who has to be revealed, y'all. He's the God who sits high, but he looks low. He's the God who dwells amongst his creation. He's the God who's not far from every one of us, Paul says. We want to give honor to this God. We want to be grateful, amen? We want to give him glory, amen? But not only do we want to give glory to our God tonight. We also want to give honor to our pastor, y'all, because he's been a, he's been a faithful image bearer, y'all. He's, he's been a walking reflection of the glory of God, y'all, not only up here, but even in my personal life. You know, when I had a little case, when I got in a little accident, pastor said, you know what, the court, the court, the, uh, the lawyer fees is on me. Don't worry about it, hun, I got it. Even when I had some financial hurdles, I had to hop pastor didn't just say, you know what, I'm going to pray for y'all. He actually hopped under and put the burden on his back and, and took it on for himself. He said, Hunt, you're not fighting by yourself. 
And listen, sometimes we can, when people talk about them, I realize they must, they don't really know them. A lot of times they just got a problem with the message and they finding a problem with the messenger. Amen. And we could do that sometimes, but we're going we're gonna to try to clear that up. Amen. So we don't find ourselves dishonoring. And speaking of, y'all, Pastor wrote a book on honor. It's right there in the, in the bookstore. We should, we, should, we should sell this thing out because this is foundational to understanding how honor works. Amen. Everybody that's even serving and feeling, man, I just, I just wish that y'all would at least get one of these. Amen. So that was a shameless plug for the night. Hey, <laughs> Lord. Hey, Lord, but, but humility, y'all, is the key to power. Just being humble. Because there's an epidemic of dishonor going on. Can I tell y'all a secret? Can I share a secret with y'all? Y'all wake out there or y'all sleeping out there? Hey, man, I'm going to tell y'all a secret. I'm going to share it with y'all. Was, was Eve, she didn't come from the head. Eve didn't come from the feet. Do y'all know what Eve, where Eve, where she was made from? The rib, amen. What does the rib protect? The rib protects the heart. And when the rib protects the heart, the head does not mind clothing the rib in power. Amen. When you learn to protect the heart of the overall body, the head never minds clothing you with power. Amen. So the secret to power is humility, when we just learn to humble ourselves, amen? And honor is actually going to be a blessing to us, amen? Hey, God, but we're going to get to it. We're going to get to the text. Tonight, we're going to be coming out of Mark 6, verses 2 through 6. And Phil actually came out of the same verse last week. I say, well, thank you, Lord. That's, that, that just fell just right, Amen? And we're going to go ahead and read it. We're going to pray. We're going to, go through, we're going to uh, list the points, and then we're going to get into it. And the text says in Mark 6, 2 through 6, it says, And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished. They, was, they didn't know what to say, y'all. Saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him? Notice they say, the wisdom that is given in, unto him. They noticed that this wisdom was beyond man. And man, they say, what, what wisdom is this that, that has uh, been given unto him that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended. They saw Jesus getting his shine on and they started hating. They got offended, y'all. But Jesus said unto them, he said, a prophet is not without honor. Oh, a prophet is going to be honored. But the only place he don't receive honor is in his own country and among his own kin and among his own house. And he could do there no mighty work, save laid his hands on a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Lord, we thank you for this word tonight, Father God. I pray, Father God, that you would, for your glory, that you would give your servant utterance, Father God, that you would open up my heart to hear from your spirit, Father God. I pray that you would open up the hearts of your people to hear from your spirit, Father God. I pray that I would decrease and you would increase, that I would sit down, God, and you would stand up. Father God, I pray that you would bless our gathering on tonight. Amen? Amen. And so we're going to have four points tonight, y'all. Our first point is going to be astonished. They were astonished, y'all. Our second point is going to be Samson's shadowing. And our third point is going to be God and man. And our fourth point is going to be our own glory, which can get in the way sometimes, y'all. Hey, Lord. Hey, Lord. And so the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom and all of these other things are going to be added unto you. Seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness. So tonight we're going to talk about the kingdom. Amen. We're going to talk about his righteousness. And one important thing about the kingdom, one important principle is honor, y'all. One of the most important principles is honor. And so tonight I want y'all to buckle up and we're just going to take a little ride through the scriptures. And we're going to, we're going to take the scripture, which is the light. It's a light, y'all. The scriptures are a light, and we're going to take that light, and we're going to shine it into the darkness of our heart, 
and hopefully it can expose anything that's not supposed to be there and anything that is supposed to be there. Anytime somebody shine a light on you, you're going to be like, yo, y'all cut the thing off. But I want you to remember, listen, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Amen. This word is a double edged sword separating between soul and spirit. And so it's, it's a discerner of thoughts. It's meant to separate our thoughts, the thoughts of our soul and the thoughts of his spirit. Amen. And so we just going to. We just going to let it shine a light. Amen. And this word is, again, it's a double edged sword. It's meant to it's meant to sculpt our hearts and prepare it for the kingdom and to prepare it for eternity. And so y'all just bear with me on tonight. Amen. Uh, again, one of the most important things about the kingdom is honor. And so in um, in John 13, verses 16 through 17, Jesus says, verily, verily. Anytime you hear Jesus say, verily, verily, you better pull up a chair, cut the TV off, and just lock in. All right? Because he's about to drop bars, I'm going to say. Jesus is about to drop wisdom when he says, verily, verily. That means pay attention. He says, the servant is not greater than his Lord. Neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. And so Jesus is painting a picture for us right here, and he wants to show us how order and power flow. Amen. He's trying to paint a picture, and he wants us to see it. But he says, if you know these things, not everybody knows these things. This is a secret mystery he's getting ready to reveal, and not everybody knows these things. But if you know these things, he says, happy are ye if you do them. So if you know these things and you do them, it's going to produce happiness in your life. Anybody want happiness tonight? I mean, so, so, so let's talk about it. Because he says, the servant that is sent by God is not greater than the God that sent him. And we all know practically that the ambassador never sends the king, but the king sends the ambassador, right? Is this right? We know that the president is never on the front lines with an M16. You're never going to see Biden out there with an M16, OK? Is that right? <laughs> and we, we, we even see that the hands are willing to sacrifice themselves to protect the head. Because we know that when the head falls, the body is going to fall with it. Amen. And so Jesus is painting a picture that we ought to protect our leaders because if our leaders are destroyed, how will we know where to go? If, 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 we, if our GPS breaks in the middle of nowhere, where are we going to go? And so it behooves us to protect our places of power. Amen? But a lot of times we find ourselves fighting against our places of power. And our enemies actually fight against our places of power. We should, we should protect our places of power. Amen? Does this make sense to anybody? But sometimes in dishonor, we kind of overlook these simple truths. And I want to tell you, if you're not under a covering, then you're not covered. Right? That means you're subject to the elements. Like, if I don't have an umbrella, I'm subject to the environment. If I don't have a jacket, then I'm, I'm subject to the environment. I'm not covered. But a lot of times we look at a covering as a restriction instead of a form of protection. My, my, my daughter, she's, she protects her little brothers. She's the older, and she protects. As parents, I protect my kids. As a husband, I'm put in place to protect my wife. Pastor protects the sheep when we're under the covering. But a lot of times we criticize our covering. We, we make fun of the umbrella with the holes in it. But is it protecting you from rain? If you don't like it, you could just get another one. <laughs> or enjoy the one that's actually protecting you. Amen? But a lot of times we focus on things over our head and not under our hands. You know, sometimes when they ask me camera questions, I'd be like, hey, that one over my head. You might want to go to Minister Phil on that one. That's just, I only take care of things under my hands. <laughs> and that's it. Amen? But this is a form of honor. But biblically speaking, we have to understand that leaders are actually meant to be burden bearers. 
That's biblical leadership is, is taking on a burden. You're a burden bearer because the Bible says the greatest among us shall serve. So our greatness is tied to our ability to serve. If we can't serve, then hey, hey, Lord, when we fight against our burden bearers, guess who left to hold the burden? And so it's just not it's not a great idea. And again, he says, um, the servant is not greater than his Lord. And so this is just an example. He's painting a picture that you should never be in front of what you ought to be following. Anytime you're in front of what you ought to be following, it's called getting in the way. <laughs> it's called putting the cart before the horse. And anytime you put a cart before the horse, the horse is either going to stumble over the cart or he's just going to stop completely. And then nobody going to go nowhere. Amen. And so when we really understand honor, we understand that honor is actually for our benefit. If you really look at honor, it's, it's, it's actually for your benefit. The Bible says, honor your mother and your father that your life may be long upon the earth. It's, it's the first commandment with a promise for you. Amen. And so we just go, we go talk about it because without honor, y'all, unity is only temporary. It's only temporary until trouble comes, and then you find out you're really not unified like you thought you was. It's like a tree. When you, you shake it, you find out that some things wasn't even really connected no more. They was just hanging there. But you got to shake it sometimes. Without honor, y'all, unity is only temporary. So I want to encourage us on the benefits of honor, the blessings of honor, but I also want to warn us about the, the curses of dishonor. Amen? Because the Bible says sin and shame actually go together. If we lose our honor, we actually going to get scorn in its place. And what this means is when you forget to honor the things that are due honor, you're going to get scorn. God is going to replace it with something that's going to give you scorn. Even if you forget to honor your car, don't put the oil in it, well, you're going to get switched out with something else. Then. You eventually is eventually going to run out of energy on you. Amen. And so whatever is due honor, you give it honor. Amen. And so I just want to encourage us tonight because we see in the text that they went from being astonished at Jesus to being offended. They saw his humanity, but they didn't see God operating inside of his humanity. Amen. And their refusal to honor actually blocked power from flowing in their lives. Anytime you see power stop flowing in your life, you got to ask yourself, wait a minute, who did I dishonor? Who did my, is, it, is it my dad? Is it my pastor? Who am I dishonoring in my life? Who do I honor? That's what David did. He said, who, who is left that I can honor? Hey, God. And so we see that Jesus marveled. He marveled at their dishonor and their unbelief, and that how he had showed them so many miracles, and they still chose to not believe. Their unbelief was actually a choice. They wasn't fooled, they just chose not to believe. Amen. And since our ability to honor is tied to our ability to unify, and our ability to unify is actually tied to our ability to receive power, because we see that in our unity is where God commands the blessing, we're going to talk about it. And we're going to talk about a few things that disrupt our honor, y'all. So we see that they stood amongst Yahshua and they were offended. The Bible says that they were astonished, y'all. They had no words for what they were seeing and what they was hearing. And that word astonished um, in the Greek is uh, ekplesio. I hope I'm saying that right. It's ekplesio. And it means to to amaze or to strike with panic, also amplifying a sense of wonder or terror, almost terrified, dumbfounded to the point of becoming emotionally stalled and shutting down. And so the Bible says that they was astonished, but they, they missed the cue to shut their mouth. They didn't shut down. They, they, they didn't have no words for what they were seeing, but that should have been a cue to just be quiet. But instead, they opened their mouth and they began to question God. And we see, if, we, if you know your Bible, you know that astonishment is actually a natural response to the glory of God. The Bible says that the pillars of heaven are astonished at his reproof. 
They're astonished, but we also know that the pillars of our faith are astonished at his reproof as well. When Moses saw the glory of God, he dropped down to his face. When Daniel saw the glory of God, he fell to his face. When Abraham saw the glory of God come into town, he fell down at his face. And even Job, who had a bunch of words, but when God showed himself, Job put his hands over his mouth and refused to speak. He became dumb, y'all, and I think we ought to take note, because even a fool, when he closed his mouth, is counted as wise. Amen? And we see that people that spend time in the presence of God, they usually have a quiet spirit about themselves. And this is actually of God. Biblically speaking, this is actually something God desires in us. If we look at 1 Peter 3, verses 3 through 4, it says, Who's adorning, let it not be on that outward adorning of the plating of the hair and the wearing of gold and the putting on of clothes. He says, but rather the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. So he's saying a meek and quiet spirit is worth more than your gold chain in his eyes. And so we ought to take note that when, when God displays his power, through someone, we should, we, should, we should not be too quick to have a, an opinion about things that we don't understand. Amen? Right. Proverbs 18, 13, he says, He that answereth the matter before he hear it is foolishness unto him. Amen? It's just not wise. And the Bible speaks about people like this. In Jude 1, 10, the Bible speaks about people like this. He says, But these, they speak evil of things which they know not. But what they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. They call them brute beasts. It's harsh, huh? Sound a little bit harsh. In 2 Peter 2.12, he says, but these, as natural brute beasts, there we go again. I think the writers are trying to convey something. He says, as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. They speak evil of things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Ooh, this is a tough word. But why does this scripture call them brute beasts? He almost talks about them as if they have an animalistic nature. And they do things based on just instinct or based on how they feel. They, they gauge what they do based on how they feel. An example of this is like a dog motivated by his greed. And when you put your hand by his food, he actually, motivated by his greed, he'll bite the hand that actually fed him in his lack of understanding. And dogs like this, a lot of times you'll put a dog down like that. If a dog bit my child, you put a dog down. <laughs> and God is not far from that logic. So when you touch his children sometimes, we got to be careful, amen? In 2 Peter 2.10, it says, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise governments, presumptuous are they, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Many times I believe we're just too quick to have opinions about people that God is using. Amen. And this is not the way of honor. This is not how you honor. Is this too tough, y'all? We should be like David who... Even though his king attacked him wrongfully, David would not put his hand on his king. Amen? Even after Saul died, he made a song about him, honoring him. Amen? We should be like Joseph, who after his brothers threw him into the pit wrongfully. When he came into power, he didn't go back and wipe his brothers out. He said, y'all did it for evil, but God was actually doing it to me for good. And so if he would have actually tried to go back and fight his brothers, he would have actually been fighting against God because God put him in place to preserve his brothers, the same ones who threw him in there. And even if we look at Yahshua, who suffered at the hands of evil men, we can look at it in, in, in 1 Peter 2, 18. We're going to read through it quick. He says, you servants must submit to your masters and show them complete respect not only to those who are kind and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. God will bless you for this. 
if you endure the pain of undeserved suffering because, of you, because you are conscious of his will. It was to this that God called you, for Christ himself suffered for you and left you an example so that you would follow in his steps. And when he was insulted, he did not answer back with an insult. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he placed his hopes in God, who is the righteous judge. He trusted that God knew what he was doing, even beyond what men were doing. This is a tough one, amen? But I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to be good like medicine when it, when, it, when, it, when, it, when it take root, amen? And so the men in scripture, they were clearly amazed at what they were seeing, but instead of remaining quiet, they began to talk beyond their understanding. And the Lord hates when we begin to speak with no knowledge, y'all because it blocks people from seeing the light, y'all. It blocks people from seeing God. In Job 38, one through three, the Bible says, then the Lord said, answered unto Job, out of the whirlwind, and he said, who is this that darkeneth counsel by words? Did you know that your words had the power to block people from seeing the light? You gotta watch how you use your words because you're gonna hide people from seeing the glory of God and God is not pleased when we speak Without knowledge, he said, who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Hey, God, this is why he said we're going to be judged according to every idle word we speak. He taking account and he listening, y'all. Ooh, that's a tough one, huh? Proverbs 18, 2, he says, a fool does not care whether he understands a thing or not. All he wants to do is show how clever he is. You ever heard somebody say, I heard somebody say, oh, yeah, y'all, Pastor, I know him. I, I went to school with him when I was 10. I don't even realize how stupid that sounds. He was 10. <laughs> what, what? And in trying to sound smart, they actually sound stupid. And so it's hard to inform when you don't have information. And it's better to just be quiet, y'all, lest you wind up dishonoring God. And we see this example play out over and over again with Moses. When they spoke against Moses, the earth opened up, swallowed them up. When they spoke against Moses, struck with leprosy. Amen. When they spoke against Joshua, when they went to the promised land to seek it out, when they spoke against Daniel, they actually wound up in the lion's den. When they spoke against Esther, they wound up getting hung. Sometimes when we open our mouth to speak against the things God is doing, it's just not good for us. The Bible says angels who are greater in power, they're much greater than us. They don't even bring railing accusations against the children of God to God. They're careful. They don't just bring no anything to God. They don't accuse the brethren before God. But Satan does. Hmm. I wonder if there's any connection sometimes. Amen. And I believe that we ought to take example from the angels, y'all, instead of humbling themselves, they just began to harden their hearts, y'all. They began to ask questions, but they asked questions not to understand, y'all. They wasn't trying to understand where Jesus was coming from. They actually asked questions to close their understanding. They was asking closed-ended questions. They was, they was asking, is not this the carpenter? Of Anybody can see that he's the carpenter. You're asking questions not to know anything, but they're asking questions to actually discredit Jesus. They wanted them to focus on Jesus' humanity instead of the divinity op operating inside of him, y'all. They was like, is not this, uh, 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 is his sisters not here with us? Of course, you see her right there. Calm down. Amen? And so they was looking to convict him of guilty based on faulty circumstances, y'all. And anytime somebody is willing to judge and condemn somebody with little evidence, you got to be careful because this is never usually motivated by a spirit of love or a spirit of wisdom. Because anytime you judge your brother, you actually up in the judgment on yourself, the Bible says. For whatever measure you judge your brother according to, you're going to be judged according to the same standard. So if you hold them at like a God-like standard, you just up the judgment on yourself. So you have to be careful because that ain't wisdom. Amen. The Bible says in, um, in Romans 2, 1, he says, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judges, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemn thyself, for thou judgest, thou that judgest, you do the same things. 
You say, oh, they can't work with unbelievers, but you just, you just signed an application to go to Coca-Cola. She working. So either way, it's, you got to be careful because when you go to judge your leadership or anybody, when you go to judge, you got to ask yourself, do you walk as blameless as your pastor? Do you, do you produce as much fruit? Before you go to talk about them, are you as blameless? Amen? Because you just, you're actually holding yourself to a higher standard. Paul said, I don't judge nothing before the time. I don't even judge myself. I'm, I'm the Lord's servant. I don't even know what he's doing sometimes. And that's the right answer. When they say cast the first stone, everybody dropped their stone and walked away. And that was the right answer. You should drop your stone. Amen? Is this making sense to anybody? Hey, Lord, praise God. But they began to question. They was asking, where did this power come from? Where is this coming from? Where is he getting this? But they wasn't asking so that they could praise God. They was actually asking for the same reason the Philistines was asking where Samson's power came from. They wanted to cut him from his power source. Amen. Jesus was shining that light and they began to say, yo, where is the light switch? Because light actually exposes the darkness. And when you expose the dark, they don't like the light because they like the dark. The Bible says this in, 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 in John 3, 19, it says, and this is the condemnation. He's giving you the key right. Here. This is the condemnation that light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest their deeds would be reproved. So they didn't like the light, y'all. They was trying to cut that thing off. They understood that the level of power that they were seeing was beyond man's ability, just like with Samson as well. And the Philistines, the Philistines that was, that, that they, they got tired of Samson's power. They was trying to get rid of him. They got to the point where they eventually hired somebody to find out Samson's secrets. Y'all remember Delilah? They hired an intimate friend to betray him and reveal secrets so they can catch him and kill him. And this is the same thing what happened with Jesus. We're going to see that men with the same spirit are going to actually hire an intimate friend close to Jesus to reveal secrets so they can capture him and kill him. Amen. But little did they know that in his death, he would do more damage to their kingdom than he did in his three years of ministry. Amen. And just like we see with Samson, he did more damage to the Philistines in his death than he did in his life. And Samson killed him some Philistines with that jawbone. Amen. He did more damage. And this is a picture of this actually is a picture of Jesus. Samson is actually a picture of Jesus, y'all. It's the shadow of Jesus. When we see Samson stretched out in between those two pillars, bleeding as his enemies stood around to mock him, and they thought he was at his weakest moment, but they didn't realize that at our weakest moments, God, is, he'll get the most glory out of our life, amen? And this is what they missed about Yahshua, in our, in our weakest moments, it's actually in our weakness that God's strength is made perfect. Amen? And it's the ignorance of his enemies that caused them to perish. God actually puts us in position through our brokenness. I know some of us may be going through some broken season, but I want you to know that God puts us in place through our brokenness sometimes, y'all. Y'all remember Gideon with the, with the earthen vessels, and when they became broken, the light was able to shine through. It's in brokenness and humility that Joseph actually got into the kingdom. It was through brokenness and humility that David actually inherited the kingdom. It's through our brokenness. Daniel came in as a servant. Sometimes the way up is down, y'all. And sometimes in our weakness, well, all the time in our weakness, God's strength is made perfect. And so this is why we ought, to not, we ought to not focus on men's weakness and be tempted to reject the glory of God. Amen. Sometimes we see people's weakness and we, 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 we are tempted to reject the power of God in their life. And this is, 
This is not good, y'all. This is not a good way of honor because it's, it's neither men's perfection or their weakness that draws men to repentance. It's the goodness of God that draws men to repentance. They should see our good works but glorify our Father in heaven and know it's from him and not us. Nobody going to get saved by knowing Brandon's goodness. No, they actually, people are actually repelled by our goodness. They're like, oh, I ain't going over. That's too much. That's too, that's too much. They actually save when they find out that God is still good, even in my weakness. Even in my imperfections, God is still sovereign. Amen? And when Peter understood this, Peter got that revelation. At first, he was on the, on the shore. He heard Jesus preaching from the shore, and he was like, amen, Rabbi, tell him. Tell him, Rabbi. But then when Jesus hopped on that boat and caused them fish to hop in that net, he said, depart from me, Lord. Depart from, I'm a sinner. Don't tell it. I'm a sinner. Because he realized he wasn't too focused on man that he missed God. And he said he realized he was dealing with more than just men right here. You know, Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. She was like, good message. Beautiful message. But when Lazarus raised from the dead, she began to wash his feet with her hair. Because she realized I'm dealing with more than just man right you know, Saul knew scripture. You understand? Saul, he knew that he was a Pharisee of the Pharisee. But there's a difference between knowing scripture and knowing the word. Amen? Knowing scripture calls him to kill Christians. And on that road of Damascus, the Lord ran into him. He said, why are you persecuting me? He said, what? When was I persecuting you? He says, it's hard to kick against the pricks, huh? You know what you're doing, because it's hard for you to do it. They got the revelation that they was dealing with more than just man, y'all. And so we don't focus on the goodness of men, y'all. We, focus, we don't focus on the, the, the weakness of men. We actually look for the goodness of God in men. That's what we ought to look for. Because spotting the weakness of men is too easy. It's, it's everybody a sinner. It's just pointless. Like, what do you do with that information once you get it? Other than use it as a reason to rebel against God. Oh, God, he, he not perfect. And, and we, we, <laughs> we use the sins of men to reject God. When God speaks through a donkey, do we go start checking it for sin in his life? No, it's a donkey. You understand what I'm saying? And so it's pointless. What do we do with this information? Does, does the truth that God spoke through a man become less true when you find out they're not perfect? No. I mean, if that was the case, then, well, we would, when we found out David killed somebody, killed somebody, a husband, and, and took him, we would have to take Psalms out the Bible then. When we find out Solomon got 700 wives, we would just have to take Proverbs out the, out the Bible then. But we would do this to our own hurt. It don't make no sense. If, by this logic, we would have to get rid of the whole Bible because there's none perfect. No, not one. So when we get ready to persecute our brothers, we have to think, y'all, will we reject God on behalf of men? No, y'all. And so we have to be careful, especially when we talk about men being used by God. We have to be careful, y'all, because the Bible says that I'm crucified with Christ, yet I live. Yet it's no longer me that live, but it's Christ that's living in me. So what does that look like? Every, every person that comes to Christ got to die to themselves, pick up their cross and bear it, and they become a living sacrifice. Amen? So that looks like Christ died so I can live, and now I die so that Christ can live through me. Amen. It's no longer us that's doing it. And listen, I thought about this. Uh, I was singing this song, and it, and it, and it popped up in my spirit. Uh, I remember Isaac, Abraham and Isaac. As, as, as Isaac was going up to the altar with his father, Abraham, he said, Father, where is the sacrifice? And he said, oh, the Lord is going to provide his sacrifice. Don't worry about it, son. And a lot of times we think that, uh, we think that, the, that Isaac is the picture of Jesus in that story. And we don't realize that actually the ram caught in the thicket with the thorns wrapped around his head, that was the picture of Jesus. 
You was actually Isaac. <laughs> Amen? Because when Isaac was on that altar, he made a vow to God. He left behind his whole future, his career. He said, God, I'm ready to die for you. But the Lord said, you know what? I got a better idea. I want you to be a living sacrifice. I want you to live, and I want you to go keep your vow to me, but I want you to be a living sacrifice for me. And we are called to be that same living sacrifice. You know, a perfect example of this is our pastor, y'all, and I'm going to keep honoring him. Amen. I know like, he keeps, yes, I'm going to keep honoring him. Amen. It ain't, it ain't no, no, no men where it's honor. And we got to remember what that looks like. And so a perfect example of that is our pastor, y'all, who sacrificed his time, his money, his strength, his effort, his family time, always on the road, a lot of sacrifice. And he dies to himself so that it could produce life in us. Amen. In 2 Corinthians 4.11, it says, For we which, ha which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but it works life in you. And it's funny because the same people that you die for are the same people that stab you in the back. The, the same ones to dip their bread with you are the same ones to betray you. But it's funny how Jesus did it anyway. And it's funny how y'all pass, he does it anyway. After d three decades of service, no matter how many knives are in his back, he does it anyway. And I want to tell you, if you can't appreciate the sacrifice of your pastor, which you do see, then how are you going to appreciate the sacrifice of Jesus, which you've never seen? You got to think about the message that you send in the God. It's important that we know how we treat men actually sends a message to God. So it's important to know that you're not just dealing with man, y'all. The Bible says in Job 32, 8, he said, there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. And for somebody to say, I don't got no spirit in me. I don't got no, no, I don't got no spirit dwelling in me. Let me tell you, Romans 8, 9, he says, but ye are in the flesh, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So you say what you say, you say, <laughs> you say it how you say it. But sometimes, y'all, the flesh can actually be a stumbling block from seeing the glory of God, y'all. And when we look at the tabernacle of Moses, we, we realize that there was a veil that a thick veil that covered anybody from seeing the holy of holies, from seeing the true glory of God hidden beyond the veil. Amen. And just like the tabernacle of Moses, we could see in the face of Moses, when Moses had the glory showing on his face, he wore a veil so that men couldn't see the true glory of God in the face of Moses. Amen. And so this veil that we see, because in Christ, this veil is taken away. But this veil in Hebrews 10, 19, it says, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil. That is to say his flesh. So we see that this, this veil is actually a picture of the flesh of Jesus. And he said we ought to look beyond the veil now to see the true glory of God. We can't get caught up in humanity and miss divinity. We can't get caught up on man and miss God, y'all. There was something beyond the veil. And 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, do you, not, do you not know that ye are the temple of God now? We get so focused on each other's flesh and our physical appearance, but do you not know that you are the temple of God now and the same spirit that dwelt in that temple now dwells in you? But we ought to got, we got to look beyond the veil. Y'all still with me tonight? But they fail to understand that it's the spirit of God that makes men great. It's not men's muscle. It's not their hair. It wasn't Samson's hair. The hair was actually a stumbling block to get Samson in place to destroy his enemies. The humanity of Yahshua was actually a stumbling block to get them to place him right in the right spot to destroy all of his enemies. But they failed to see God, and they only saw man, y'all. And so I, hey, Lord, 
It wasn't Samson's strength, y'all. If it was his strength, they wouldn't have hired somebody to find out where his true strength comes from. Nobody looks at King Kong and be like, yo, where his strength come from? Nobody look, at, nobody look at the hawk and be like, yo, where does he get all that power? No. They, 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 <laughs> they were astonished because this power came from beyond men's ability. Amen? Amen? But they failed to see that it's God that rules and reigns in the affairs of men. And instead of admitting that it was God at work, they chose to believe a lie. Amen. Jude, uh, Judges 1620 tells us where Samson's strength actually came from. And the Philistines, uh, she said, the Philistines are upon thee, Samson. And he woke up out of his sleep and said, I will go out as other times and I'm going to shake these haters off. I'm going to get rid of them this time again. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. He woke up and he didn't understand that the Lord had left. It was Ichabod. He left. His muscle was still intact, but his strength left. And we see that his strength wasn't his muscle. It was the spirit of God. And sometimes we can play the Nebuchadnezzar and we can forget that our strength actually comes from the Lord. It's not, it's not, it's not by our power nor our might, but it's by his spirit. Amen. And instead of understanding that God was working and performing his will as he pleases, they missed it. Y'all in Philippians 2, 13, to give a little caveat, he says, it is for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And so he gives you the, you thought it was your idea, but it was actually him that gave you the will. You thought it was you doing it, but it was actually him that was doing it. To do his good pleasure. There's a spirit in man and the almighty gives him understanding. Amen. But Nebuchadnezzar, we see when Nebuchadnezzar forgot, God had to quickly remind him. And when he said, look at what my hands have built in the next few verses, we see that he's in the field eating grass like an animal. Because the Lord was able to strip him of all his honor, glory and his wisdom and take it off like it was a jacket and just let him sit there for a minute. And then he placed it back on him. And when Nebuchadnezzar caught his head, he said, God has did this to me to show you that God rules and reigns in the affairs of men. And he places whoever he wants to place, even the basest of men. The Bible says even the base, that means even the dumbest people he'll put in power for his own glory. And he expects that you honor what he does. Amen. Thank God. But it's important to understand that it's God that's in full control, y'all. It's God that's in full control, and he has all of the power. And so Pilate says to Jesus, he says, don't you know that I have the power to crucify you or let you go? And Jesus looked at him, he said, hold on, cowboy, because you wouldn't have no power unless it was given to you from heaven. Even the people that crucified him, he put them in place. This is important to understand, y'all, because when we understand this, I think it's a freeing revelation to understand that God is in full control. No matter who your boss is, it don't matter who your, your supervisor is, who your husband is, God is in full control. And if you honor God, then he can cause even your enemies to be at peace with you. He turns the hearts of the kings whatever way he want to turn it, y'all. The Bible says that, that uh, Jesus said this, he said, I have uh, all power is given unto me both in heaven and in earth. In Romans 13, one, it says, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Promotion don't come from the east or the west, y'all. The battle is not given to the strong and the race is not given to the swift. God actually gives swiftness to the racer. Amen. And sometimes we could think that it's Moses that caused the seas to split instead of understanding that it's God that actually decided to partner with men. We could think that it's men that caused the walls of Jericho to fall instead of understanding that it was God accomplishing his will through men. We'll think that men caused the sun to stand still. But if you ask these men, they'll tell you where their power came from. Amen. But so we have to be careful how we deal with the people that God has put in place to lead us, teach us, and help us, because they actually doing so 
on behalf of God and by the grace of God. Moses didn't know what he was doing. Moses was confused and scared half the time. He led the people out of Israel. It was God that was doing it, y'all. And so when he says, when you have done it to the least of these, you have done it unto me, he means that in a more literal way than you think. There's a spirit in man, y'all. When I first got this revelation, y'all, I cried. And I said, God, I'm sorry for every time I never told you thank you. For every time I didn't honor you, for every time I never said thank you, I'm sorry. Because remember, he said, when you've done it to the least of these, and they're going to say, when did we feed you, God? When did we give you a cup of cold water? When did we come to jail to encourage you? And he's going to tell them, when you did it to the least of these. You was doing it unto me. And so the revelation is that how you treat your brothers, how you treat everybody out here, is your opportunity to show God how much you love him. How you treat God, how you treat your pastor, is that how you would treat Jesus if he was your pastor? Is that how you would treat Jesus if he, if he, was, your, if, if he was your wife or, you know, just for the sake of, because he lives in everybody? How would you treat him in every position? Is that how you would treat Jesus if he was your child? Because Jesus came as a child too. You understand? Is that how you would treat him? Because that's how he expects you to treat your brother. Amen? This is why anybody that say, I love God, but I don't like my brother or my sister, you don't understand how this thing works. <laughs> You're missing it. It's, it. You can't say that you love God and hate his children. Because he actually, God actually shows his kindness through people. He expresses himself through people. So when you say that you hate people and you love God, you're lying. Amen? Because honoring man is actually a form of honoring God. If we look at how they paid tithes to the Levites, the Levites actually got to enjoy the stuff that they was tithing. But it was actually a form of worshiping God by honoring men. You know, when God revealed his glory at a certain place, they would build an altar and they would put sacrifices on the altar. Wherever God revealed himself, they would put sacrifices on the altar to honor God. So they was dealing with earth, but they understood they was really dealing with God. If we could have that revelation where God reveals his glory, that we would honor those places. Glory. Hey, Lord. But I want to tell y'all, listen, without people, I'll be honest, without people, you wouldn't even have a Bible to read. Without people, you wouldn't have no King James Version. Without people, you wouldn't have no pastor to walk you in the ways of the Lord. Without people, you wouldn't even be here. Amen? And so when you can't appreciate the kindness of God in people, then you, you can't appreciate the kindness of God reserved in heaven for you that you've never seen. It's just, it's just hypocritical, amen? And a lot of times I feel like we misunderstand that we married to Christ. Okay? So when you're married to something, the two become one. The two become merged together where you can't even tell the two apart. You, when you, when you go to a marriage ceremony, you're going to see they take one vase, two vases, and then they pour them together and they mix them to where they're, in, they're inseparable. You don't know where one started and the other one stopped, so you can't never separate them. When they tie the rope, the rope is, it actually looks like one when they finish. And this is a picture of how God wants to be one with his people. Hey, God. Is this making sense, y'all? Y'all tell me if it's too harsh. I, and I'm, I'm telling us this because I believe that when we, we understand this concept, it's going to be a key to learning how to honor y'all. When we understand that we're doing it not just unto man, but as unto the Lord. The scripture says in Galatians uh, 3.23, it says, And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily. Do it with your whole heart as unto the Lord and not unto men. Get them out the way. Focus on God. Don't take men personal. Don't be too quick to get offended with men. Focus on God, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. And it's good. This is good to understand because it's good to know that our, our, our honor is not only received by man, but it's received by God. When you honor your parents, you're actually honoring God. 
When, when a wife honors her husband, she actually painted a picture of the glory of God. It's our, it's, 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 isn't it God's will for us to honor our leaders? We, we don't make this stuff up. But they began to overlook truth, y'all. They began to overlook the truth. And it's really because they didn't believe God. They didn't believe God, so they didn't believe Jesus at all. Because, listen, if they would have believed the law and the prophets, the law and the prophets were actually a picture of Jesus. Samson, the tabernacle of Moses, Joshua, all the, Joseph, all these people we're talking about are clear pictures of Jesus. So if they would have believed the law and the prophets, then they would have had no problem believing Jesus. But they didn't believe, y'all. And they were so used to suppressing the truth and overlooking the truth, using their titles and men's appearance of success to dictate what truth was. They had no problem overlooking truth when they was looking him right in his eyes. They had no problem doing it because they got so used to doing it, y'all. And men have this tendency to try to make God in their own image instead of conforming to the image of God. They want to remake truth into their own image. Men have that tendency to want to scoop God aside and take the glory for themselves. They want, it, they want, it, they, they want the glory. They want the worship, and they'll scoop God aside, and they'll, they'll begin to make their own rules. Amen? And we see that men that, that dishonor leadership usually want to do this because they don't want to be subject to anybody's will other than their own. And this is what Satan himself did. In heaven, in his riches, and his glory, he said, you know what? I want the worship. I want to make my own rules. And these men, they begin to act like they father the devil or they act like the enemy. They begin to operate in the ways of Satan, y'all. And they begin to pervert the truth. And so truth, what he did was he took off all of his glory. He took off all of his titles. And he came down in the form of a nobody. And he looked them in the eyes and he said, you recognize me? And they didn't. Without all the glory, without, this is what truth looks like without all of the men's appearance. And they couldn't recognize him. He did like, who was that Pastor Mitchell TV show where the boss walks in and disguises himself as the employees. And he began to remind them of the rules, and they began to talk evil about the boss, not recognizing who the boss was. Amen. And this is the same mistake they're making. In Philippians 2.6, it says, who being in the form of God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men being found in the fashion of a man. He humbled himself. But still, y'all, they rejected the truth as they always have. Has they always killed their leaders who tried to lead them in the way of God? So did they kill him. The Bible says, but all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. He that hateth me hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no other man did, they would have not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. And so the same way that they hated Joseph, the same way they hated Samson, David, Abel, Daniel, and all of the prophets, it's the same way that they hated Jesus. It's really because they hated God, but it's really because they hated the light. Remember, the condemnation is that light come, has come into the world, but men love darkness. And they refuse to submit their heart. And so, y'all, I want us to be careful of our hate for our brothers and our sisters. I want us to be careful of that because all of those men that I mentioned just now in Scripture, whether it was David, Abel, Cain, or whoever it is that I mentioned, they found a reason to justify their hate for them. They found a reason to kill them, but it was really to cover up an unconscious hate for God. So when you hate your brother, you got to ask yourself, what, what, am I really angry with God? It's going to cause us to not be so offended with men, and it's going to cause us to, to be more honest with God. Like, God, I, I'm dealing with some things. Amen? Amen. Oh, we getting there, are you? We getting to the finish line. <laughs> but they began to remind themselves that Jesus was just, they tried to remind themselves of, their human, of his humanity. But you don't have to remind yourself that somebody is a human unless you believe you found evidence that they otherwise. <laughs> Amen? I don't sit at the dinner table trying to convince myself my wife is just a human. That's just not what I do. But they began to say to themselves, yo, isn't this the carpenter? 
Isn't his sisters amongst us? And they were, they, their hearts were blinded to what they already knew spiritually, y'all, and they began to suppress the truth. They began to suppress the spirit. In Romans 1.18, I want to read this, y'all, because this changed the way I look at a, at a lot of things, and especially evangelism. Man, this changed the way I look at it. In Romans 1.18, it says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godless and the wickedness of people who suppress the truth in their wickedness. They know it. They just push it down so it don't come to the surface. They suppress the truth. Romans 1.19, it says, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath shown it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and his Godhead, they know, so that they are without excuse, but because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Amen? So they already knew, but they suppressed it. You already know the truth. God has filled the earth to testify of his glory. Everything testifies of his glory. So they without excuse, the Bible says, but they was dealing with an internal battle. And, and sometimes we all find ourselves at some point having these internal struggles, but our desire for sin could cause us to lose these battles, y'all. It could cause us to lose these battles when we want to hold on to our anger, when we want to hold on to our our, our resentment or whatever it is we holding on to, we could lose these battles. And, you know, they refused to submit because they loved their sin. Regardless of all the stuff that they had seen Jesus do, they still chose not to believe. And Jesus said, listen, if you don't believe me, at least believe me for the work's sake. Because the works are testifying of what no man could do these things. But you don't want to believe me. You didn't want to believe him. All right. And so he said, listen. I have a greater witness than John in John uh, 5, 36. He said, but I have greater witness than that of John for the works which the father hath given me to finish the same works that I do bear witness of me. He said, so y'all believe John and he didn't even do all of this stuff. I got a greater witness than John, y'all. But when we hold on to that anger and that bitterness and that unforgiveness, it, 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 it blocks the light of God from flowing through our heart. Amen. And so they received, they didn't, instead of receiving Jesus as a blessing, they rejected Jesus as a curse. Amen. And a lot of times we get like that. You know, they, they thought because God was trying to give them a Sabbath day, that it was a way of God trying to put them behind instead of get them ahead. Instead of understanding tithes was a way to preserve them, they thought it was a way to take away from them because their hearts were rebellious, y'all. Their hearts were rebellious. And sometimes we get like this. When God tells us what we can't do, we think it's a way of God actually trying to suppress us instead of a way of blessing us, y'all. They perceive the laws and the word of God as grievous and burdensome. And how they approach the written word is actually how they approach the living word. They, they approach Jesus with the same resentment, the same unbelief, the same suspicion, the same doubt, y'all. And they wanted nothing to do with him. And so when Christ shined that light, they realized that this light was beyond their control. And when things are out of men's control, a lot of time men have the, the, that natural nature to try to put things back under their control. Like when you see a spider in a room, it's a man's natural tendency to want to kill the spider, eliminate the threat, and go back to the comfort zone. And this is what these men were doing. They were trying to eliminate the, the, the threat. They, they had this natural flight or flight, the fight or flight response, y'all. But the only problem is our, flight or, uh, our fight or flight responses don't work when it comes to God. They're actually counterproductive when it comes to God, y'all. The Bible says in Romans 8, 7, I like to pull scripture, y'all, because I don't want y'all to think it's me. So I pull the scripture so we can get some clarity, amen? All right. And so Romans 8, 7 through 9, it says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. This carnal nature can't even be subject to the, to the laws of God. 
So our, our natural fight or flight responses don't work. And so our own understanding is actually too limited to, to, to fulfill the purposes of God, y'all. The Lord actually, uh, he desires us to be selfless in a sense. Because being selfish is one of the main causes that we dishonor. It's one of the main causes that we overlook the glory of God when we become too focused on ourselves, when we become too focused on man, we actually miss God, y'all. The Bible says in Luke 17, 33, whosoever shall seek to save his life shall actually lose it. So that fight or flight response to protect yourself, it'll actually get you in trouble with God. Because God wants us to trust him. And so this allows us to know that our natural responses are booby trap. <laughs> Leaning to our own understanding is actually not the safest bet. When we see that the, the, you know, with Moses, with the fiery serpents that attacked Israel in the wilderness, when Moses lifted up the serpent, he says, so shall the son of man be lifted up. And when Moses lifted up this serpent, the way to survive wasn't to run or to try to suck the poison out. You just die tired. The way to survive was to focus and trust in him, to shift our focus towards him and look toward the, the, the serpent, which was made in the image of the problem, but to really trust the God behind the bronze serpent. The bronze serpent was just a stick. But God was looking for us to trust him beyond the storm, y'all. He was looking for us to trust him beyond the problem. Amen. Hey, God, let's skip something to get ahead a little bit because I know we're on time. Amen. But sometimes when we overlook the glory of God, we tend to focus on our own glory. And when we seek to preserve, uh, preserve our own glory instead of the glory of God, we actually wind up rejecting the will of God and distorting truth. And so what I mean here is when we see Saul, who was the king, when God showed that his will was to elevate David, Saul wanted to protect his own lineage, his own family. And so the only way to do that was to suppress the glory of God. So he tried to kill David and suppress the truth of God. Amen. Even with Eve, when she was in the garden, the devil told her, God just don't want you to be like him. And so she, she, when she caught that, she said, okay, I'm going to dishonor the word of God in search of my own glory. That's why she left. She, she was looking for her own glory. Amen. Even Cain, we see that Cain, when Abel was the approved sacrifice, and it was the testimony that this is how God wants us to sacrifice, Cain got jealous and he tried to kill his brother to suppress the truth of God. And sometime, I'm telling y'all, when we seek our own glory, we actually wind up distorting the truth, y'all. And we see these men in Scripture doing the same thing with Jesus. They tried to push Jesus out the way that, so that they can, they can keep their power and continue doing what they wanted to do. But we ought to have that mind where we don't seek after our own glory, but we seek after the glory of God, y'all. Jesus said, nevertheless, Father, not my will, but your will be done. And we ought to walk even as Christ walked. We ought to, we ought to have the mind of Christ. Amen. And so we up on close and we right here at the end of it, y'all. Y'all still with me out there, though? This is a tough message, and, it's, and it, we're just more so teaching tonight, but hey, this is an important subject. This is going to release power in our life. When we understand how honor works, it's going to release power in our life. Amen? If we just don't get too focused on man and miss God. This is going to help us to honor all men, not just leadership, but all men. The Bible says, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. But the Bible says, Ananias and Sapphira, when they laid it at his feet, y'all, we wrapping up, y'all could play. When they laid it, when they laid they, they part or the price at the apostles' feet, they said, what tempted you to lie to the Holy Ghost? And they didn't realize that they was lying to the Holy Ghost. They thought they was just lying unto men. But he said, you had not lied unto men, but unto God. Amen. And in that moment, because they didn't understand what they was dealing with, they mishandled what they was dealing with. This is why warning labels are important. Sometimes we mishandle the things we're dealing with to our own hurt, like Uzzah, who put forth his hand to touch the thing that carried the glory of God, and he, he died in that moment. Y'all, he paid the ultimate price. And so I think these are important concepts. If we understand this and we live by these concepts and we learn how to honor, it's going to be a blessing to us. 
This is a tough message, but I think it's beneficial because we perish for a lack of knowledge. Amen? And only the truth can set you free from a lack of knowledge. But, y'all, the Lord put two choices before us. He said, I put before you life and death, the flesh and the spirit. You can choose which one to give your heart to. But he said, I would choose life. Amen? You don't have to say to yourself, who's going to bring Christ down to show us how to walk this thing out? Who's going to bring Christ up from the dead to show us how to walk this thing out? It's as close as your heart. He's not a God that's far off. And so if you ever seen yourself in a position where you have overlooked the glory of God, we're going to pray tonight. If you ever found yourself so focused on earth that you miss heaven, we're going to pray tonight. If you heard the gospel and anything I was saying where we talked about Isaac being the sacrifice on your behalf and you want to give your heart to God, we're going to pray tonight. Amen. If y'all will repeat with me, say, Lord, we sorry for any time that we've overlooked your glory. God, we want to honor you. Father, we honor men in order to honor you, God. We repent of any sin, Father God, and we turn our hearts to you, praying that you would give us a new heart, that you would give us your spirit, Father that you would forgive our sins. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hey, Lord.